the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, now for the 49th time. I am Joran Hansen, I'm the Secretary General of the Academy. On my right is Professor Per Strömberg, Chairman of the Prize Committee. On my left, Professor Peter Järdenfors, also a member of the committee. This year's prize is about understanding the psychology of economics. Årets pris handlar om att förstå psykologin i ekonomin. Kungliga vetenskapsakademin har beslutat att utdela Sveriges Riksbanks pris i ekonomisk vetenskap till Alfred Nobels minne för år 2017 till Richard H. Failer för hans bidrag till beteendeekonomi. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has decided to award the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel to Richard H. Thaler for his contributions to behavioral economics. And you see the photo of Dr. Thaler on the screen above us. He was born in 1945 in New Jersey in the United States. He got his PhD at the University of Rochester. And he's currently professor of behavioral science and economics at the University of Chicago. He is a US citizen. And after that announcement, the chairman of the prize committee, Per Strömberg, will give us some introductory remarks about the research and the uh, laureate of the prize. Uh, Thank you. Economists uh, are a lot about trying to understand how people uh, make economic decisions and behave when they interact uh, in markets. Now the problem is that human behavior is very complex. So if we want to construct useful models of economic behavior, we have to make simplifications. One such simplification, which has been very important in economics, is the assumption that humans behave in a fully rational way and make economic decisions to maximize their own well-being. This simplification has been uh, incredibly powerful and has helped economists construct models to analyze a large number of important uh, economic phenomena. Now, it's not that economists believe everyone is rational, uh, but the issue is that whether the deviations from uh, rationality are important enough and systematic enough to really affect economic outcomes uh, in an important way. Now, uh, over time, researchers gather more and more evidence uh, on how human psychology actually deviates from this fully rational model. And Richard Thaler is a pioneer when it comes to incorporating such insights from psychology uh, into economic analysis. For the last four decades, he has used both theories and conceptual models, lab experiments, empirical tests and surveys to document and analyze how specific aspects of human psychology systematically shape economic decisions. Richard Thaler's findings have inspired many other researchers coming in his, in his footsteps, and it has paved the way for a new field in economics, which we call behavioral economics. And thanks to his contributions and discoveries, this new field has gone from being sort of a fringe and somewhat controversial part of economics to being a mainstream area of contemporary economic research. And insights from behavioral economics has not only been important for academic economic research, but has increasingly been applied to design better economic policy. Thank you, Per. And now, Peter Järdefors will give us some more insights into this area and the discoveries that led to the prize. Peter, the floor is yours. Yep. <clears throat> Richard Thaler is a pioneer in integrating economics and psychology. He's analyzed three ways in which humans systematically deviate from the traditional economic models. First, even if we try to make rational decisions, we have limited cognitive abilities, our rationality is bounded. Second, even, if our, if though, even though our decisions are often guided by self-interest, we also have social preferences and we care about fairness and equity. And third, we sometimes suffer from lack of self-control. I will now present some of 
Thaler's contributions to each of these areas. First is bounded rationality. Thaler has proposed a theory of mental accounting. It builds on the observation that most people in their minds group their payments into different accounts, housing, food, vacation, and so on. Many of you have a credit card, and uh, your account for the card has a high interest rate. At the same time, you may have a savings account uh, for a future vacation, for a new apartment that has a low interest rate. This may seem irrational, since money from a low interest savings account may be used to pay off the debts on the high interest credit card account. Uh, but you're afraid that if you take out money from your savings account, you will not put it back. So having a credit card account is a way of preventing you from excessive spending. And in this way we can exercise self-control and commit ourselves to spending less by keeping separate mental accounts. Mental accounts have boundaries over time. They can be opened and they are closed. So for example, buying a stock can be seen as opening a, a, a new account with the purchase price as some kind of reference level. Um, if a stock gains in value, it's easy to sell it and close the account. But people are aversive to losses. So if a stock loses in value, investors tend to wait uh, for the value to get back to the purchase level, uh, at least. And they ther therefore hold on to losing stocks longer than is economically rational. The second area is social preferences. In many situations, socially oriented motivations, such as, such as a desire for fairness, are important. And in joint experimental work with his colleagues, Thaler has shown how judgments about fairness uh, play a role in economic decisions. A, a simple example is a store that normally sells umbrellas for, for $10, but raises the price to $20 or, or even more uh, during heavy rain. So if consumers take the normal price to, uh, as a reference point, they will regard this as unfair pricing, and such reactions may influence the pricing policy of, of the company. Similarly, someone earning $20 an hour uh, working in a company typically uses this as a reference wage. If the company in a recession proposes to cut the wage from $20 to $15, this will be considered unfair by the employees. Such fairness judgments explain the relative stability of wage levels, even in, in bad times. The third area is limited self-control. We all live with a conflict between our desires for the present and our hopes for the future. A classical example is uh, uh, Odysseus, who is torn between his desire to go to the sirens and his future plans. Uh, such a conflict may lead us to deviate from our long-term plans. So when you're 30, you may decide to start saving for your retirement when you're 35. But when you turn 35, uh, you may change your mind and keep up your consumption rather than start saving as previously uh, planned. Together with his colleagues, Thaler has devised what is called the planner dual model for how this conflict can be handled. The planner is concerned with the well-being in long run, while the doer only concerns uh, the current uh, is only concerned about the current well-being. So, to co resolve the conflict, the planner can either force the doer to do something by exercising costly uh, willpower, or impose rules that limit the range of the doer's uh, choices, just as Odysseus did when he tied himself to the mast. Common examples of such rules are: don't keep alcohol at home only buy one cigarette, a pack of cigarettes at, at a time, or don't buy food when you're, when you're hungry. Uh, the planner duo model captures the idea that one can, one can resist temptation at the cost to the psyche. Similar dual system models of decision making have later been applied and studied in psychology and in neuroscience. 
I finally turn to applications of the uh, economic models. Thaler has, together with his colleagues, advocated what they call libertarian paternalism. The idea is to, to design policies that nudge people to, into making better decisions for themselves. For example, Thaler has devised a nudging mechanism for pension savings called Save More Tomorrow. In the program, an individual commits to allocating a share of future salary increases to savings. This policy helps people exercise more self-control. An important aspect is that the participants can opt out of the program at any time. But in reality, very few decide to opt out. The Save More, program, Save More Tomorrow program has been successful since it has substantially increased pension savings. So to sum up, Thaler has given us new insights into how human psychology shapes decision making. He has devised new experimental tools to investigate human behavior. His research has spawned a new field, behavioral economics. And he has shown how policies based on insights from this field can help people make better decisions. He's made economics more human. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for that great <coughs> introduction. Uh, and now we may have Dr. Thaler with us on the phone. He's on his way to the phone, at least. Not yet. While we're waiting, uh, questions to the panel. Anybody who's brave enough to ask uh, uh, one of my colleagues here a question? We prepared for a lot of questions, so don't be shy. Don't hesitate. You had all expected this price, of course. Dr. Thaler? Yes. Hello? Hello. Hello, Dr. Thaler. This is Joran Hansen, the guy who woke you up an hour ago. Good morning, John. <laughs> Good morning. Have you had your cup of coffee now? Uh, yes, I'm awake. Great. So we're here in the session hall of the Royal Academy of Sciences uh, with uh, journalists from Sweden and, and all over the world. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sure they are eager to ask you questions. I hope they have also had their cups of coffee, so they should be prepared to ask some questions. Who would like to start? Please, lady over there. Hanna Malmodin, Swedish Television. Uh, what would you say is the most important uh, impacts of your research? Well, then in order to do good economics, you have to keep in mind that people are human. Now we didn't hear, there was something wrong with the connections for, for a second or two. So could you repeat the answer, please? I, I said, I, I think the most important lesson, uh, our connection isn't good. <laughs> uh, hold on a second. So, re try to repeat the question and we'll see if we can. Yeah. You, what would you say is the most important impacts of your research? The most important impact? Uh, yes. So, so I think the most important impact is the recognition that economic agents are human and that economic models have to incorporate that. Yes, the lady over there. Hello, Jenny Peterson from TT News Agency. What was your first thought when you got the call this morning? Uh, well, um, I, I was pleased. Um, I, I no longer will have to call my golf buddy, Gene Palma, Professor Palma on the golf course. Yeah, he was here a few years ago, wasn't he? Yes. <laughs> right. Do you have a question over there? Uh, hi, this is Jens, <clears throat> Jens Nordstrom from TV4 in Stockholm, Sweden. First, congratulations, Mr. Thaler, on the prize. Uh, 
Thank I'm, you. I'm wondering, uh, I seem to recall you had a short Hollywood career in the movie The Big Short. You explain the hot hand fallacy about how somebody who is uh, successful in something is assumed to be successful going on. I'm wondering if that applies to the current American president, Mr. Trump. <laughs> Well, um, I, I do think that the uh, film career is probably uh, was important to the awarding of this prize. Uh, I was I was disappointed it wasn't part of the of the official speech. Um, as to President Trump, um, I, I think he would do well to watch that movie. I'm also wondering, there's a substantial amount of money involved here in the prize, nine million Swedish kronas roundabout. I'm wondering if you're going to be super rational about this money or if you will act humanly and in what way you will act humanly with the money in that case. Well, you know, this is actually quite a funny question because as the, as the citation noted, one of my fields of research is what's called mental accounting. And according to standard economic theory, there's no way of knowing which money gets spent on what. So um, if I put my good Chicago economist hat on, then I can't answer your question. <laughs> but but, but I, I will say I will try to spend it um, as, as irrationally as possible. <laughs> Very good. Yes, later, really, please. Uh, congratulations, uh, Professor Taylor. Uh, this is Shifit and Axelsson from uh, Freelance for China Radio and uh, Voter for Green Post. Uh, I just wonder, you, you know, in, in your research, uh, did you touch upon the Chinese economy? Because Chinese economy was very much uh, influenced by the Chicago school uh, thoughts, I think. And uh, in your opinion, what's your prediction about Chinese economy in uh, five years? Say, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I have no expertise at all on the Chinese economy, except that it's growing very rapidly. But I have not, no insight. Sorry. Okay. Uh, oh, we have a question over there. Yes, please. Professor Thaler, I had the opportunity to listen to you in Stockholm recently when you were talking about the pension system in Sweden. Uh, do you think that your policy advice will have more impact now when you have a, a Nobel Prize winner? Um, <laughs> well, I don't know. You, uh, um, I, I don't know whether the Swedish Parliament uh, how they think about these Nobel Prize winners, but. Um, uh, I, I hope they, they listen to the research I presented and the additional research that my colleagues and I are doing, uh, because I think there are uh, ways to improve the uh, Swedish pension system. Great. We need that. Please. Uh, Professor uh, Taylor, congratulations. This is Yiming Fu from China's National Xinhua News Agency. My question is, you obviously opened the door for the, uh, uh, the research on economics and psychology. So I wonder, uh, in the future, uh, what will your research direction go? And in which specific areas uh, would your research results be uh, applied to? Thank you. Well, I, I've never been one to plan my research uh, very far in advance, but as the previous questioner indicated, uh, I've recently been studying, of all things, the Swedish pension system and uh, the choice architecture of that system. And um, my colleagues and I are working on a paper on that right now. Uh, the tentative title is Nudges Are Forever. Okay, um, I think we've pretty much covered the, the questions that were raised here. And uh, so 
Dr. Taylor, thank you very much for being with us at this press conference and we look forward very much indeed to welcoming you to Stockholm in December and I for one could, could benefit from some advice about my own private uh, pension system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you all in December. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Now, have you thought of any questions to the panel, or is everything crystal clear? I guess you're all waiting for the... Ah, there is a gentleman over there. Yes, please. Yes, David Keaton, Associated Press. Um, so this is the second year in a row where there have been no female winners uh, amongst all the prizes, and several years now that there have been no uh, female winners for this specific prize. Um, do you have an insight in why this may be? And uh, second, second part, uh, could you tell me a little bit about, uh, more about the decision-making process? How many women are on the panel that decide this, and is it fairly representative in your opinion? Okay, I'll start and give you the general figures for all the prizes, uh, and then Pastor Rembey can comment more specifically about the prize in economic sciences. The, we, we are very proud of the laureates who are awarded this year and were of those last year and so forth. But we are disappointed looking at, uh, in a larger perspective, that there aren't more women who have been awarded. Part of it is, of course, that we go back in time to identify the discoveries. You, we have to wait until they have been va verified and validated before we can award the prize. And there were an even a larger bias against women in terms of fewer female scientists if you go back 20 or 30 years. Uh, but I'm not sure that's the entire explanation. We have taken measures, we and the other prize awarding institutions, if you look at the uh, committees now, the Nobel committees, uh, there are um, women chairing uh, actually three of the six committees. Uh, there are female scientists or equivalent on all the committees. Uh, so I don't expect I don't think there is an, a, any substantial um, male chauvinist bias in the committees. And we are also, the committees have invited, taken special efforts to identify f women scientists to start no to nominate for the prize uh, to a greater extent. But this started this year because we are concerned that we may not get enough nominations of female scientists. Um, we, don't dis we don't nominate ourselves. We invite nominations from the scientific community in the world. And uh, I suspect that there are many more women who are deserving to be considered for the prize. And therefore, we have um, started to identify specifically uh, leading fem women scientists and I invite them to nominate. Uh, we will, starting next year, um, I indicate in our invitations to nominate and ask, ask the nominators to identify women scientists and also consider ethnic diversity, geographic diversity. And finally, um, we are gonna ha going to have a conference this winter with the different prize committees to discuss this issue. So we are concerned we have, are taking measures. I hope that in five years, ten years, we'll see a very different distribution. Uh, and that's the situation as of now. Pat, what's your comments regarding economic sciences specifically? Yeah, I can just underscore uh, what you said. I think there are two important points. Uh, one is that we are indeed awarding um, uh, research that um, uh, where the discoveries were made, let's say, in the 70s, 80s, maybe early 90s, during a time when, uh, when we had much more uh, of a gender bias in economics as well as in other, uh, many other sciences, uh, which basically means that as time goes by, the fraction of female laureates will increase. Uh, I'm certain of that. And you can look at some of the prices that are given to more 
uh, to younger economists, um, you know, some of the top prices there, the gender distribution is much more uh, even. Um, and the second thing is that that said, this is something that we are very concerned about. Um, what you have to realize is that the committee doesn't just freely decide on these prices. We aggregate the opinion of, you know, nominators all over the world, and we're very reliant on their nominations. So if there's anything we can do, I guess it's a call uh, for the nominating body to, to also take these issues more seriously. So consider this an, a, a request to all our nominators for all the prizes to consider uh, also women scientists who have made important contributions. Please. Uh, I, I just like to ask uh, uh, any of you who can comment because when we have the Nobel Prize in medicine, people understand as that okay, that give us a good message that we should not work too late, um, and then in this economic price, my understanding is that uh, people should be rational and uh, don't spend all or maybe save your money for pension a little bit earlier or at a reasonable time and uh, quantity is uh, my understanding okay Peter, uh, what would you, you say? comment that Peter. Yeah, yes i mean that's a fair description i mean what distinguishes failures models from others is this it brings out this conflict between our desires for the present and our plans for the future and uh, in retrospect we sometimes regret what we've done last night or last year. Uh, so this, he has devised methods for us to, he has told us how to nudge ourselves to, to be, apply more self-control, uh, for example in terms of saving, but there are many other application areas as well. More questions? Last final question, please. Uh, my name is Ivan Schick from Langes uh, uh, I wonder uh, about Richard Thaler getting the prize alone. I mean, if you look back, uh, uh, most years uh, the prize has been shared between different candidates and uh, two or three ones, but uh, this one is the only one. And uh, uh, does that mean that his uh, contribution is so unique, or does it mean that he has been working uh, all alone, or, or what is the explanation? Well, this is, uh, um, uh, I guess, an issue not completely uh, uh, easy to answer, but I mean, when we, when we uh, um, work through these, these prizes and these areas that we want to award, um, we, we try to find the people that are, you know, most responsible for the particular area that we want to, uh, to give the award to. Uh, sometimes it's a very natural uh, group of people. As you know, we can give, uh, award the prize up to three candidates, but other times there is a clear uh, person who is behind uh, the area that we want to uh, award. Um, and I, in this particular case, uh, it was clear to us that, that a solo prize to Richard Thaler was the natural one. Now, there are many researchers following in his footsteps, um, and uh, uh, you know, so one should, would not be surprised if, if other people in this strand later on also get recognized, but who knows. Okay, I think we'll close there. Those of you who have requested individual interviews uh, will be able to do them right after this. Thank you very much for your interest. <laughs>